We'll start now. Okay, now recording. So no camera today. Um, hopefully uh, the Apple store can fix my laptop tomorrow morning. I have an appointment scheduled in Sacramento. I'm gonna drive my ass down there and hopefully get my laptop fixed. We will see. Um, so because everything has been thrown off for me, uh, this week, including today, is going to be light on videos. So we're going to do probably like 40 minutes today, uh, maybe 45 if I can't stop talking, and uh, just one video for later on in the week. But hopefully the material is going to be pretty similar to things we've seen before. Because at this point, we're kind of just putting some pieces together. We've kind of laid out all the puzzle pieces in front of us, and now we're just going to kind of sort them into the right spot. Um, so I don't think this week should be terrible, but it's going to be like the material we need to see really the potential of statistics into the future. So um, this week's going to be short on material, no video or no image of my face because I have no camera, at least for today. Hopefully by next week, everything will be back up. Um, let's see, what else do I have? Um, okay, yeah, so the week's going to be awkward because I don't really have my recording workflow set up right now because of my broken laptop. Um, oh, this is the last week for student evaluations of teaching. Um, so I ask that you fill out uh, an evaluation of my teaching. You can find instructions in last week's recordings or up on Discord, there's an image that shows you where to find the link in your Blackboard shell for the student evaluations of teaching. This semester has been an experiment for us all, but it's certainly been an experiment for me. Uh, these course notes idea were like an attempt at flexibility. I think that has worked for some, but not worked for all. If you all have polite and respectful and constructive feedback on the course notes. I welcome that. Um, that's what I'd like you to particularly say something about in your student evaluations of teaching, if you haven't already, um, is tell me what has worked for you and what hasn't worked for you, what has and has not out of the course notes. Um, I thought they were going to be great, and I think they've turned out to be mediocre at best. Um, but I'd like to hear from you all instead of just having my own opinions about it. Um, let's see, I think those were my three announcements for the day. My camera is busted on my laptop, so um, this whole week is going to be light on material because I don't really have a recording workflow available like I have other weeks. Um, last week of SETs, Student Evaluations of Teaching, I think that's it. Okay, so before we jump into conditional densities, I'm gonna show you all where you can find a good reference, written reference for the material for this week. So in our syllabus, if you scroll down to the section textbook, go to the first link, the first book in our syllabus that I recommend. And from our first book, Chapter two, from the first book in the syllabus, chapter two, section eight. Section eight of chapter two from the first book in the syllabus is going to be an excellent resource on um, conditional densities. I do not recommend as a first attempt the second book's treatment of conditional densities. I do not recommend the second book's treatment of conditional densities because it's a little too mathematical. And I think it's too easy to get lost in the math and lose sight of the bigger picture. So I'm going to use um, essentially the outline here from chapter two, section eight of the first textbook found in our syllabus. The only thing that's going to really change is the notation. I try to use notation that I think is a little bit more helpful to what I 
think is going to be the issues for you all in reading the notation, but uh, there is a difference in the notation between the book I'm recommending here and what I will type out here on our whiteboard today. Um, I will try to point out the differences in notation as we go so that you understand what the book is doing differently in case you go to read that. Okay, so those are my announcements. First textbook in the syllabus, chapter two, section eight is a good reference for the material for this week. My camera is down, so you don't get to look at my pretty face as we go through the material this week. That's a bummer, I know. Uh, and this is the last week for student evaluations of teaching. Please provide polite, respectful, constructive feedback. That's what I ask. Please and thank you. Are there any questions or other announcements before we get started? Okay, then here we go. Conditional densities. This is gonna be super similar to conditional probability. So I'm gonna start with a little recall of, do you remember what we did last week on conditional, or two weeks ago on conditional probabilities? The logic is gonna be the same. We're only kind of doing a jump from probabilities to density functions, but much of the rest of it stays exactly the same. So we'll do a little recap and then a definition and then two examples that I've chosen in particular, because I think they highlight um, a point of confusion that often comes up when you first start looking at these things. So here we go. Recall conditional probability. for two sets, A and B, the conditional probability of A given B is really just some shorthand notation for the following fraction. So it's almost like it's just a notational convenience for the probability of A intersect B, that is A and B both have happened, divided by the probability of, you all help me out, what goes in the denominator here? Is it B, probability of B? Perfect, thank you, Jacob. Indeed, whatever is being conditioned on goes in the denominator. That is the way you remember it, or at least that's the way I remember it. I hope it helps for you all. Whatever is being conditioned on, that is whatever is after this pipe operation, this pipe character, which we can read as given or conditional on. Whatever is conditional on here goes in the denominator. So we're to think of this as there being some sample space that contains two sets, A and B. Now the intersection is whatever happens in both sets. So I'll just shade that like this and hopefully that makes sense to everybody. And we're really asking for the probability of the intersection divided by the probability of B itself. So the logic goes, if you know B has already happened, conditional on B having already happened, then you're essentially somewhere within the set B. If you know B has already happened, you're no longer in the entire sample space somewhere, but instead you're within the set B. Knowledge of B having already happened kind of reduces 
the places you could be. It kind of brings you to a new base, a new point of comparison to ask how much area is in the intersection. So if we know B has already happened, we're then asking what is the probability of A given B has already happened. Given B has already happened, what is the probability of A? This is essentially just B has already happened. So relative to B, what is the probability that A then also happened? Relative to B, assuming B has already happened, what is the probability that A then also happens? It's literally just the area of the intersection divided by the area of B itself. The area of the intersection divided by the area of B itself. So what I'm really trying to stress here is not necessarily the notation, but instead the logic behind the probability of A given B is really like asking the question or asking something like a question, does the probability of A change given B has already occurred? The probability of A given B is allowing us to update our knowledge or lack of knowledge about the probability of A occurring given B has already happened. So it's like we're learning something new from these events, from these outcomes. We are learning something from B, namely that we're no longer somewhere in the sample space. Now we're somewhere within B explicitly. We are now specifically somewhere within B. And given the knowledge that we are somewhere within B, given B has already happened, what is the probability of A? So as long as A and B are related in some way, not independent, then the probability of A is going to change given the knowledge of B. And that's really what I'm trying to focus on here, which is why I'm sitting at this point for a little bit and just repeating things over and over, hopefully in different ways. One way, which my fingers crossed, will work for you. Kind of give you a intuitive understanding that this conditional probability is the probability of A given B has already happened. So it's like saying, how does the probability of A change given our knowledge of B having already occurred? I'm going to pause here for just like 30 seconds in case anybody's got a follow-up question. And then I'll just move on to a definition, which is going to come, look very similar from this. It's going to come from this sort of logic. Okay, it doesn't appear like there's any questions. So here goes our definition of conditional density. Let f of x and y be the joint density of the two random variables x and y and let h of y and g of x be the 
marginal densities. Okay, because this is all new, let's just stop here for a moment too. So we're getting ourselves involved with density functions now that involve two variables, x and y. So now there is a density that describes the more likely values that the random variables x and y may take on. Whenever the density is higher, x and y are more likely to take on those values, or at least within ranges around specific values where the density is higher. So we have a joint density over two variables, and then marginal densities for each of the variables individually. So if we just start with one, let's just say h of y, this is the marginal density for the variable y, which is found by, let's just say integrating, but if it was a discrete distribution, we would sum, but we'll just stick with one of them. You can find the marginal density for y by integrating the joint density over x. And I emphasize that because it almost seems backwards. To find the marginal density for y, integrate the joint density over x. To find the marginal density for y, integrate the joint density over x. Now the reason goes like this. If you take the integral of the joint density with respect to x, you're essentially integrating out the variable you do not want. After you perform integration with respect to x, you will be left with only a function of y. After you integrate the joint density with respect to x, you will left, be left with only a function of y. And that is indeed how you get a marginal density. You integrate over the variable you do not want. So we could use the exact symmetric argument for the marginal density for x. You integrate the joint density over the variable you do not want. So to get the marginal density for x, integrate the joint over y. Okay. What we're going to do now is create a conditional density. This is the conditional density of x given y. We call it g of x given y. Now, this is a weird bit of notation. What we're actually saying is the variable is x. And this x depends on, in some sense, y. But here, we suggest y is fixed given y has already happened and it has some specific value, what is the new density for x? Okay, well, it has a form very similar to conditional probability. The joint density goes in the numerator and whatever is conditioned on goes in the denominator. This is the general form of a conditional density of x given y. It's always the joint in the numerator divided by the marginal of whatever is being conditioned on in the denominator. So symmetrically, we could say the conditional density of y given x, the h of y given x is equal to, and the same logic holds, it's the joint in the numerator divided by the marginal of whatever is being conditioned on. And the same logic goes as before for the conditional density of y 
given x. We are to think that x has already happened and now takes on some specific value. We are to imagine that x has already happened and now takes on some specific value and x for the moment is fixed at whatever specific value it takes on. And now y is a new density or there is a new density on y given this particular value of x. There is now a new density on y given some particular value of x. Okay, let's try out some two examples if nobody has any questions and hopefully the examples will make these sentences seem much clearer and I'll just repeat them again when we get there. Okay, consider the joint density f of x and y equal to 6x squared times y, where x is in the interval of Z, uh, all real numbers from zero to one, and y is also in the interval of all real numbers zero to one. Step one, let's find the marginal of x. So in order to find the marginal density of x, I'm just gonna get a little practice with our marginals in here. We're gonna integrate the joint density with respect to, somebody help me out, what are we gonna integrate the joint density with respect to to find the marginal of x? What variable do we wanna get rid of? Nice, there it is in the chat, thank you. We're gonna integrate over y, and y has bounds zero to one. So I'll give you all maybe like a minute, minute and a half to perform that integral. Then if you get a good solution, type it into the chat or say something. And once we have some consensus, we'll move on. Perform that integral to find the marginal density of x. should get out a function of x. Should get out a function of only the variable x. Okay, we got one solution, possible solution in the chat. Oh, a competing solution. Go for like two more guesses. See if we can get consensus somewhere. We currently have a tied vote going on. Come on, fifth voter. Let democracy work. Uh, okay, we'll call that democracy. <laughs> All right, so we're gonna integrate with respect to y. So we've got, oh, there we go, we're getting there. 6x squared, y squared divided by 2, evaluated from 0 to 1. So let's see, that 6 over 2 is where these people are finding their 3 from. Nice, we're starting to see consensus. I like it. 3x squared, 
y squared over 2 evaluated from 0 to 1. Luckily, this 1 is just going to turn into a 1, and the 0 is going to cancel the last one out. So we've got, hang on, that was my typo. Um, caught myself before another typo. 3x squared. There we go. There's a marginal for x with x in the interval 0 to 1. Perfect. Thank you all. OK. That's, that second one shouldn't have y squared over 2. It should just be y squared. Oh, all I, thanks. You are right. Thank you, Jacob. Um, OK. With our powers combined, we can math. Go us. <laughs> OK. Next practice problem up. Let's see if we can move this one down a little bit. Let's find the conditional density of y given x. I'll fill in the definition for us, because that's the easy part. And this one's not so bad. What goes in the numerator? What is the joint density here? That should go in the numerator. Uh, 6x squared y. Thank you. And somebody else, how about the denominator? Three x squared. Nice. Brandon, good to hear you. We don't always hear you. So what do we got here? Um, x squareds cancel. Six over three turns into a two y. Does that sound okay to everyone? OK, let's do part three. And then I'm going to come back to part two here. Let's do part three. And then I'll come back to part two, because there's a lesson to be learned here in part two based on our answer to part three. So recall that two random variables are independent if we can write their joint density as the product of the marginal densities. So you all help me out one more time here. What is the marginal with respect to, uh, oh, we already did that one. What is the marginal with respect to y? So we're going to try to answer the question, are x and y, the random variables, independent based on their marginal density functions? We can claim two random variables are independent if the joint density is equal to the product of the marginal densities. We already have the marginal for x. That's just 3x squared. What is the marginal for y? So you got to integrate the joint. Is that Alex? Yeah. Thank you. It is indeed. Hopefully you're seeing a connection by some pieces we've already seen before. So indeed, 6x squared times y can be broken up into the two marginals. The marginal for y. 2 times y, and the marginal for x, 3x squared. So yes, independent. But if we can take the joint density and break it up into the product of two marginals, well, then look what just happened for this definition of conditional density. Indeed, we took the numerator 
and we broke it up into the product of two marginals. And then we divided by the marginal with respect to X since way back over here, that is exactly what we conditioned on. Well, in this case, because the densities are independent, we get out exactly the marginal for Y, no matter whether we're looking at the conditional for Y given X or the marginal. Because X and Y are independent, the conditional density of Y given X is exactly equal to the marginal for Y. Because X and Y are independent, the conditional density for Y given X is equal to the marginal for Y. If X and Y are independent, then it doesn't matter what value X has, it's not going to influence Y. They are independent. It doesn't matter what value X takes on, it's independent of X. And that's exactly what we see here. The conditional is actually just equal to the marginal. I chose this example to show you what happens when they are independent. The next example I have is to highlight that conditional and marginal densities are not always the same. When X and Y are dependent, the conditional density will be different than the marginal. So here's an example that highlights independence. Do we have any questions based on the independence of these two random variables? Okay, let's try one more example then. And this will highlight the other side. This will highlight dependence, not independence. Consider the joint density X plus Y for X in zero to one and Y also in zero to one. All right, you all, I'm not even gonna give you the first hint you all take a minute and try to find the marginal with respect to Y. I'm not gonna lead you in, I'm just gonna leave you to your own. Try to find the marginal with respect to Y. Any takers? No, y'all are gonna make me do this terrible integral by myself, huh? All right, here we go. To find the marginal for Y, we integrate the joint density with respect to which variable? Can you at least give me that? Is that X? X. Thank you. And the X ranges from zero to one. So in this case, we've got X squared over two plus Y times X evaluated from zero to one. And that's really just one half plus X. Wait, one half plus Y.
Anybody object to that? It was objectionable at first, but I think I cleared it up. Okay, that seems okay. Or at least no one's audibly telling me it's wrong. Let's try two here. The conditional density of X given Y is just equal to the joint density divided by the marginal of Y. So you all tell me what goes in the numerator. X plus Y. Nice, Brendan, thank you. How about the denominator? So one half uh, plus Y. Thank you, Jaron. Plus Y. Okay, here it gets a little bit more complicated. This is actually a density just on the variable X. Now I'm suggesting it gets more complicated because it looks like Y is also in here. And it is, but we are to think when we look at the conditional density of X given Y, we are to think that Y is held fixed. And this is only a density on X. Y is held fixed at some value. And this is a density on X. Now the interesting part is if Y is held fixed at let's say one quarter, like 0 0.25, then we get some density on X. But if Y is then held fixed at three quarters, we get a different density on X. And if Y is you know, eight twentieths, we get a different density on X. Okay, one more time. And if Y is pi over four, we get a different density on X. So in fact, what we're seeing is very similar to conditional probability before. We are learning how the value of Y, knowledge of the value of Y, is influencing the density on X. We are learning how knowledge of the value of Y, given some value of Y, how does the density of X change? given some value for Y, this whole conditional density is the new density for X, given some value of Y. Okay, here we go. Are X and Y independent? What we need is the joint density to be equal to the product of the marginals. Does that work out in this case? Well, by symmetry, you can see that the marginal on X is just gonna be one half plus X. The marginal on Y is just gonna be one half plus Y. Does this hold? No. Indeed, thank you. No, they are dependent. X and Y are dependent. You can see the dependence through the conditional density. You can see the dependence through the conditional density. You cannot break up the joint density in terms of the product of the marginals. So you get no cancellation out like we did previously. You get no cancellation out because they are dependent. They are not independent. Because of that, there's no fancy cancellation that happens. And now new values of Y will give us entirely new densities on X new values of Y will give us entirely new densities on X. 
new values on y will give us entirely new densities on x. This is going to be the main tool through which we learn to relate two variables in the world of statistics. This is going to be the main tool through which we learn how two different variables can affect each other in the world of statistics. Whenever you hear the word correlation or something like that, it is through a conditional density structure that we are relating the value of some variable to the value of another variable. This is gonna to be totally cool stuff. For today, that's all I've got. Y'all helped me through these examples. Thank you so much. I've got one video that helps us through some more practice on joint and marginal densities and then visualizes conditional densities. I'll post that sometime here after class um, before Monday is over. This week should be a little bit lighter for you all, um, mostly because I don't have a laptop right now functioning. But I think that'll give us a good opportunity to kind of take a breather before the last, well, I guess we have like two or three more weeks of the semester, depending on what you're counting. Okay, so I'll stop recording here, but I'll stick around for the next eight minutes in case anybody's got any follow-up questions.